Hi again then guys and welcome to another instalment of the Beards and Cars podcast which of course you can grab in its audio only form from SoundCloud via the link down below and this week I actually wanted to talk about a topic that is very close to my heart something which I have had a lot of theories about and very strong opinions on for quite some time but it's not necessarily something that I've talked about that often on the channel. And I think that Beards and Cars is the appropriate place to do so. And that is, as you saw from the thumb, from the title, the relationship, more often than not, I believe, a very undervalued relationship that manufacturers have to racing games, specifically with regard to marketing and sales of vehicles. Now, I want to stress, before we get into the meat of this discussion, that I do believe some manufacturers do take it more seriously than others. There are certain manufacturers who, very early on, for instance, on the App Store for the iPhone, would have these little game experiences. I believe Audi and Mercedes, amongst others, had these little apps that you could play, which were, you know, just little games, but of course they were designed to attract your attention more to their cars. So some manufacturers do get it, and I have no doubt that certain manufacturers, especially the smaller ones, really appreciate being featured in racing games because it gets more light shed on them. In fact, I have living proof of this recently. I've been in talks to people who I can't name yet about companies that I've spoken about on the channel who are very small and certainly do appreciate the exposure. And being in something like a racing game means a huge deal to a company like that. Even, for instance, when I went to test ride those two motorcycles recently on the channel, the whole reason why that was a beneficial thing for not just me, but for the dealership as well, the English Electric Motor Company, is because, by definition, they are niched. Electric bikes are still a niche. It's not the norm. So, of course, any kind of beneficial street-level word of mouth is going to, of course, benefit them immeasurably. They can't afford the billboards and the TV ads that someone like BMW or Audi can, so word of mouth is very, very beneficial. And I believe that racing games are actually one of the biggest untapped markets for successfully influencing especially upcoming customers to purchase vehicles in the future. And although, of course, the possibility is there that I could be wrong, I believe that many, if not even most, manufacturers don't really take that seriously enough. And I was actually speaking to the guy who owns and runs that English electric motorcycle dealership about this theory. And it was something that he said he hadn't thought of before, but he could understand exactly what I meant. That these games actually do cause people to love vehicles that they may have never even heard of. In fact, I specifically told him, and it was the absolute truth, that the primary reason why I wanted to go and test ride these electric motorbikes is because a few years ago, I'd never heard about them before playing something like, you know, a tourist trophy or a ride game. Not because I wasn't looking for them, but because there are some vehicles that you just miss. They're obscure, they're rare, they're small companies, they don't have the marketing, and no matter how much you love Unsung Heroes, even as I do, there are always cars that you haven't heard of. Many of you guys on the channel can even relate to this directly. Just think, for instance, for those of us who are old enough to remember Gran Turismo 4 coming out and playing that, remember how many cars were in that game that you'd never heard of before? I know for me there were plenty. I had no idea what Chaparral was. And look at me now. (laughs) I love Chaparral, I love the 2J. So many others too, which I'd never heard of before that game. Games like Project Gotham have doubtless introduced people to vehicles that they never heard of before, like the Y2K Turbine Superbike, my favourite vehicle of all time, numerous others too. But it's much more beneficial than just learning about new supercars. And one of my favourite things about this discussion is that I don't even need to go to Google to look for evidence. I am the living evidence that this theory is true. And the reason why I can say that unequivocally is because of the car that I drive. I literally purchased a Volkswagen Touareg V10 TDI purely because I enjoyed driving it in Test Drive Unlimited 2. That is the honest truth. And you can say back and forth all day long whether or not that was a good or a bad, a sensible or an unwise decision. That's all irrelevant. The only fact that matters is that that is true. That is why I wanted the car. That's what made me love the car in the first place. And it probably wasn't the first time I'd heard of the vehicle, but it was certainly the thing that sparked my interest. Something like my dream car, the Ferrari FF. When I first saw that car, I specifically did not like it. When I first saw it, I believe in Top Gear. 
uh, the magazine. Then I raced it in Forza, and I over time fell in love with the car. That's the power that a game can have, and it doesn't even need to be the most realistic game around. And I believe that this is such a colossal, truly a colossal form of marketing to the most impressionable age of people out there, kids and late teens, to actually literally grow their love for vehicles, but even for specific brands. Now, I'm not going to necessarily make any suggestions as to how that could be best done. That's not really the kind of business mind that I have. But at the same time, I believe that there is definitely a lot of untapped potential there. And although, of course, I don't want all racing games to become one big billboard for a car manufacturer, and, you know, a certain manufacturer will pay the game developer for their car to be just a little bit better than everything else, it wouldn't surprise me if some games have already done that, but that's not what I'm saying should happen at all, of course. In fact, quite the opposite. The Touareg V10 is far from being the best of SUVs in Test Drive Unlimited, I just loved the car. My dream SUV is also in that game, the Spyker D8, and even though I didn't hear about it from that game, again I first saw it in a Top Gear magazine, I loved it more because of the game. Even stuff like motorcycles, as I said earlier on, I had never heard of Energica before playing the ride games. Not that I can remember at least, and yet, look at me now. Fast forward, what, a couple of years, if that, and I'm riding one on the channel. <laughs> because that's the power of a game. Because if I hadn't played that game, I would have probably heard about the bike far later on. And then maybe I'd have started loving the bike even later than that. And who knows where we would be now. It would be a completely different timeline of events. To me, this is such a, a misunderstood sphere of marketing and of influencing. They like to call YouTubers influencers, but I believe that racing games are also within that category. They really do influence people. And I'm not talking about, you know, games making you violent or some dumbass stuff like that. I mean specifically from a marketing perspective. Even for something as simple as merchandise, think of how many of us own pieces of clothing with game or manufacturer related content. Maybe you have a t-shirt with a car on it because you love that brand. Maybe you have, in my case, a, a coffee mug that's Nuka-Cola from the Fallout franchise. I have a, a jacket that's the Red Hood from the Arkham Knight game. People buy stuff because they love a game. And yet, for some strange reason, that logic doesn't seem to be given the same amount of weight and respect when it comes to making a car or a motorcycle purchase. And of course, yes, it is much more of a significant purchase than a t-shirt or a mug, but it's still a similar principle. You're buying something to show your love for it because it was sparked in a game. And I think that the core underlying problem that many car manufacturers have with this process is that they simply don't respect the medium of gaming. Gaming still has, as much as us gamers like to think otherwise, a stigma. It doesn't have a stigma within pop culture whatsoever anymore. It's the cool thing to do now. But as far as big business goes, that is where it's still a grey area. Many of them clearly, by their actions, show that they don't take games as seriously as they could be. If they did, you would see manufacturers actually coming to developers to want their cars in the game, rather than the other way around. You wouldn't need to be chasing manufacturers asking, oh, we'd like to feature your car in our game. They'd have already asked you, and on some occasions they do. I reported months ago on the fact that Zenvo wants to be in Gran Turismo. Now, Polyphony, of course, is notorious for really being hopeless as far as business goes. They, they prove that time and time again, beyond argument at this point. But the point is, companies do want to be featured. Isdera wants to be, the Commendatore, which I featured on the channel. They even, uh, I believe, reposted a change.org petition that somebody started and which I signed to feature the Commendatore in Gran Turismo. So, as I said, some manufacturers do take it seriously, but I believe that more don't. And I think that one of the most beneficial things of a form of sport that I honestly have very little interest in, which is, you know, this kind of FIA stuff in Gran Turismo and beyond Gran Turismo, eSports, you know, in Forza, in various other games as well. Although I'm personally not a fan of it, I don't watch any of that stuff and I have no desire whatsoever to compete in it, I do still think that that specifically could well be more beneficial than many of us realize to aid in this process of games being taken more seriously.
I mean, look at where we already are. We had the Nissan Nismo Academy, which made real race drivers. We now have the FIA stuff, which is doing a similar thing for certain ones of the drivers, and doubtless more in the future. Now, that is interesting on a professional racing level, but on a more street level, it still hasn't quite kicked in yet in terms of buying cars and having sales. Because the single most crucial nugget of information that I would ask you to take away from what I'm saying today is this. Racing games are not just a way to play. They are a way to engender lifelong love into young, impressionable minds. And under normal circumstances, I would say that that was a dangerous thing. It's borderline propaganda. However, if the thing in question isn't harmful, such as a car, then I have no problem with it. If a particular game causes you to have a lifelong love for a brand or for a vehicle, then to me that's not a bad thing. Not unless, you know, the brand or the vehicle does harm to people, but generally speaking that's not really going to be the case for any one manufacturer over another one. So to me, I think this really is an untapped gold mine for any manufacturer who finally takes it seriously enough, and I believe that some manufacturers, and I would actually bet money that Mercedes is probably one of them, would be actually looking into the future of this and beginning to more seriously consider their options when it comes to this kind of stuff. It's definitely something which I hope to see more of in the future, and although, as I said, I don't want the game to end up being one big billboard, there's certainly ways that you could organically feature it in the game. For instance, maybe manufacturers not wanting as much money to be featured because they understand the benefits go way beyond just money. It's far more beneficial than that. In fact, it ties into what I said earlier on. What companies like EEMC, selling those electric motorbikes, do understand. What companies, like the ones that I can't mention yet that I've been on the phone to, understand. And what many of these big ones don't understand, ironically. And that is that word of mouth is by far the most beneficial thing you could ever have. It's more beneficial than a billboard. It's more beneficial than a TV ad. Because loyalty cannot be bought. It is gained. And that is what us fans of these smaller brands have. We have loyalty to them. My loyalty to brands like Panos, Chaparral, even slightly larger ones like Maserati. I don't do it because they pay me to say so. I mean, I wish, but that's certainly not the case. I love them already, because I choose to, because I develop that over time. That is always going to be more beneficial and, crucially, far more believable to any other potential customer than somebody who's paid to say, oh, this week's sponsor is blah blah blah. And I truly, strongly believe that the first manufacturer to actually take this stuff seriously will really be onto something special. And as soon as one or two of them begin to do it, the rest of them will be playing catch-up. And I, for one, am actually very excited for the time that that happens, because as far as I'm concerned, it is only a matter of time. And I'm certainly excited to see what kind of changes this could make in the future. There are probably some changes which some of us won't like, maybe even myself. As I said, if it gets too much like an advert, for instance, then of course we will feel, not betrayed, but, you know, talked down to. So as long as it's done in the right way, I have no problem with it, and I'm certainly intrigued to see what manufacturers come up with in the future especially as they take it more seriously. But overall, that's it for this instalment. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. Is this something that you've thought about? Do you agree, disagree? How do you think it could pan out if it will in the future? And do you think that manufacturers take it seriously enough? Do you think that they don't, as I don't? But either way, tell me down below. Of course, stick around on the channel for more topics like this. Click the playlist on screen to check out all of the other podcast episodes. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.